Here, um, this morning, I think we have, um, we have largely discussed uh, Iraq and uh, many have pointed out how uh, many of the challenges that uh, Iraq is facing are actually have some of their roots in the Syrian conflict. Uh, uh, more specifically, um, uh, the issue of sectarianism and sectarian polarization in the region, which is affecting, uh, which is affecting both Syria and also Iraq, and uh, on the other side also the, um, uh, the proliferation of um, Al Qaeda groups uh, uh, across Iraq, uh, Syria, and Iraq frontier. So. Today we are here now to discuss more in detail what is actually this conflict looks like uh, in 2014. And um, I, I think I would like uh, actually the discussion to be focused on, uh, first of all, the issue of uh, sectarianism. What is the role of sectarianism in this conflict, in the endurance of this conflict? The second question, I think, is a question that concerns uh, all of us. Uh, we were uh, here at the Suleimani Forum uh, one year ago discussing Syria, and uh, um, I think that one uh, question that comes naturally is, uh, well, has anything changed in this conflict in one year? What is new? We, ha we see a Kurdish region emerging in the north, but it seems almost, we have almost the feeling that this conflict, this Syrian conflict, is going in a loop that is very difficult to break. We have a regime and an opposition which are not really an alternative to each other. And on the other hand, we have an international community which seems, seems quite powerless in breaking this cycle. So to answer this question, we have four distinguished speakers. Um, first of all, we have Fabrice Balanche from the Université de Lyon. I can actually use my French in this <laughs> situation. Okay, then we have Andrew Slater, uh, a faculty member at IUS. Uh, Karen Abu Zaid from the International Commission of Inquiry for Syria. And then um, uh, my dear colleague Peter Harling from the International Crisis Group. Please, the floor is yours. No, Fabrice. If you want to, you can, uh, we can stay here. Mm. I can go there too. Oops. No, I like to stand. Yeah, thank you very much. She's so, Syrian revolt uh, became quickly a civil war, economic, political, and sectarian civil war. And since about one year, uh, it started a religious civil war. All sectarian problems are coming back. The, the maps, please. Uh, these battle maps, what we have on, uh, on this side, show you that the, the, dif the, um, the different zones in Syria. In yellow, on the west, you have the governmental zone. In red, you have the rebel zone. And at the north, the Kurdish zone. So we can see on this map, it's this map of conflict is very similar to the sectarian map of Syria. Syrian national integration did not succeed. The fragmentation process started at the end of the Turkish Empire. It started again, and we are in a process of balkanization or process of Lebanization in Syria. During the 70s and the 80s, thanks to Arab and Soviet support, Hafez al-Assad developed, tried to develop periphery. We have on this map the, the development of Syria, irrigation, industrialization on the periphery against the center. In this uh, development maps, you see that the west, the coast, what does it mean, the Alawite region, uh, benefit a lot from the development of Syria because uh, Hafez al-Assad tried to use his community to support this power. But there were so many economic difficulties in the IT that he was obliged to abandon this, try, this development and to come back more liberalization. And since 20 years, we're coming back in a situation where you have the main city, Aleppo, Damascus, who are coming back to the center, and the periphery who are abandoned by the system. And this is generated a lot of frustration in the population most in the Sunni uh, rural countryside, uh, Sunni rural population. Alawite population are more um, protected 
because they are working about, for the state, about 90% of the Alawite community is working for the state, so they escape to the poverty, but it's not the, the same case for the majority of the Syrian in the liberalization. The problem that in Syria, the demographic context is very bad because population is still growing very fast. Since 1945, Syrian population twice every 20 years. When you look the age pyramid of Syria, it's not like Tunisia, it's not like Iran, it's not like Turkey, it's like a country from uh, sub-Africa. Uh, sub Demographic bond is exploding now, but we will have an explosion during 20 years at least. Growth is reducing slowly, but we can see that Syria is overpopulated related to its economic situation. For the regime, this trend becomes a problem because religious minorities like Alawite, Druze or Christian who support the regime reduce their fertility rate from the uh, 1980. For instance, an Alawite woman now get only about two or three children. Instead, Arab Sunni get still an average of five or six more in the north of, the, of, north of Syria. Here you are example, for instance, of Raqqa Mohafaza, where you are, Daesh is very uh, present. It's 99% Sunni, and you see that the age pyramid is very large, but does it mean that they are making a lot of children? Instead, Latakia Mohafaza, which is both two-thirds Alawite, you can see that the reducing of the population. And that, 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 this is a problem for the government, for Assad regime, because the Alawite was probably 15% at the beginning of the IT, and now it's only 10%. And it's very difficult for the regime to, to get some new soldiers uh, in this uh, community. By the contrary, in the north of Syria, you can see that the underdevelopment and alphabetism, for instance, is very high. And that's why there is so much Islamist group in Aleppo, Raqqa, Derzor, uh, Mohafaza. The Alawites are still the majority of the officers in the army, but Sunni are the large majority of soldiers, except in special units like the 4th Division, aviation and tanks. That's why it's so difficult for Bashar al-Assad to recapture quickly the whole country. It's an explanation of the large anti-Assad cleansing, but does it mean poor Sunni Arab cleansing? Because if you want to win the peace, Assad needs to push out about 5 million of people. He need to reduce the percentage of this rebel category in Syrian population. It's not the only cleavage in Syria. Of course, if you take the situation in Aleppo, Aleppo is divided between the west, it belongs to the government, and the east, it belongs to the rebels. On this map, you see that East Aleppo, most of East Aleppo, it's illegal settlement. It's people who are coming from the countryside 10, 20, 30 years ago, and it's the same people that in the rebel. But in the West, Aleppo, it's Sunni too. You have a Christian minority, but most of the people is Sunni. But it's middle class, it's urban middle class, and these people support the government because they're afraid from the poor from the countryside. In Damascus, it's the same thing. You have the center against the periphery. Uh, in green on these maps, you see the rebel pocket in the West Huta and the South Huta, surrounded by the, the military forces, that they are using um, Druze and uh, Christian localities like Jeremana, uh, Stahnaya, uh, to surround the Sunni uh, localities like Mahadamiya or Daraya on the South. Assad is using a counter insurgency strategy, but it's not the same than in US, but than US in Iraq against Al-Qaeda or British in Northern Ireland. It's a very massive repression approach. He wants to separate rebels from civilians. He wants to wait population is fed up about the rebels or abandon the area because of fighting. In this strategy, he's using the Kurdish uh, population, he's using the PUD militia, which is at the north of the Syria, to close the border with Turkey.
because the Kurdish in Syria want a region from Afrin to Kamishlo, and it's very useful to Assad to support the PUD because he's uh, closing the Turkish border. And now we can, if, if at the beginning the Kurdish and the Assad regime was enemy, today I think that there is a strategic alliance because it's more uh, suitable for the Kurdish a weak Assad than a strong Arab opposition. Um, so I think personally that Assad regime is going to win the war, um, but we can have a free scenario. The, um, can I explain three scenarios? First scenario, if what's happened in Syria if Assad regime falls, I think what will have division of Syria, an Alawite state, a Druze territory, Kurdish territory, but also Kurdish cleansing at the north of Aleppo, and we will have an Islamic state, Daesh, uh, in the east of Syria. And I think that also we will have a civil war in Lebanon because Hezbollah will be weak, and uh, I think his enemy want to, to destroy him. So we have a risk of spillover if the Assad regime falls. The second solution, second um, scenario, Assad regime wins. I don't think that he could recapture all the Syria, but uh, if it, it, it will have um, a direct and in, indirect administration. The west of Syria will be in the under direct administration and the east of Syria and the north of Syria in direct administration because you need to make a deal with tribal, tribal tribes on Euphrat uh, to push out uh, the Islamic group. But in this case, we will have a very strong anti-Assad cleansing. What does it mean, anti-Sunni cleansing? Because if you want to um, win the peace, he must to push out five million of people and to give the land and the houses of, the, of these refugees to people that they are faithful. And these people, Alawite or Sunni, will be more faithful because we didn't want that the refugees coming back to Syria. We have about 2.5 million of refugees uh, outside Syria, 7 million inside Syria. And by the end of the year, I think we will have about 4 or 5 million of refugees outside. And it will be difficult for them to come back if Assad uh, win the war. We can have a third scenario, statu quo, informal partition of Syria. Assad don't win and the opposition don't win too because she is too divided. And it can stay like this three, four, five years, like Lebanon, for instance, and divided in a few uh, infusion. Um, personally, I think that the, the second scenario um, will arrive after two or three years, but it depends on geopolitical. It not depends on Syria, but more on geopolitical. If Russia and Iran uh, continue to support Assad, and if United States and Saudi Arabia uh, stop to support the uh, insurrection. There is no uh, good scenario for, for Syria. Assad is going to win the war, but I don't think he will win the peace definitively. By the end, 10, 20 years, Syria will explode, I think, on sectarian border. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Merci, Fabrice. Um, it's quite a catastrophic scenario, actually. One of the, each one of the three, I don't know what to wish for, but... Um, um, I tend to, to guess that uh, what will happen will be something in between one of these three, and probably, <laughs> who knows? The second one, but uh, by 10 years, uh, we will have the same, uh, same problem in Syria. Okay, um, uh, Andrew will... Um, uh, you, no, no, as you want, you can uh, actually talk, from, talk from, uh, from, the, from here, or if you want, have the podium. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to talk about sectarianism, particularly in the context of the Syrian military, um, which has the, been the topic of my research the last year and a half. Um, I've been conducting interviews with Syrian deserters uh, over the last year and a half, particularly in the Iraqi Kurdish region, 
Um, so I will confess that my perspective is largely from those Syrian Kurds who've come to Iraq. Uh, but I think that they provide a very good panoramic of the conflict from the beginning because uh, by the nature of deployment in the Syrian military, soldiers are taken away from their hometown. So Kurdish soldiers have seen fighting in all the major areas in the West. Um, so, um, and the reason why I, I think this, uh, the issue of Syrian foot soldiers uh, brings up major issues of sectarianism within Syria generally um, uh, because I think that even if we think about the crucial larger discussions of geopolitical implications or the strategic situation in Syria or the disposition of forces, if regular rank and file soldiers weren't willing to go out and sustain the war, it simply would have stopped a long time ago. So the question that kind of struck me in my research is why is it that the Syrian army is able to sustain continuous combat operations for three years, despite the fact that most of its soldiers have very low morale. Uh, most of them feel disenfranchised along sectarian lines. So this was really, even though my research was focused on the narratives of these personal soldiers, a lot of major conclusions came out of this research. Um, and what I discovered is that a lot of this has its ties to very historical roots. So uh, when Hafez al-Assad initially came to power in the 1970s. He realized that he was keenly aware that his rule was on precarious ground uh, and that he realized that he needed to do certain things to, to ensure structurally that the Alawi minority would be able to sustain rule, particularly after the Muslim Brotherhood uprising in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So I want to discuss some of the ways that, that he accomplished that and that the roots of those structural changes in the military uh, continue to affect Syria today. Um, the first of which is uh, the enforced secularization uh, that's taken place across Syria and how it's removed questions of religious identity from the public sphere, uh, which is deeply enshrined within the military. So the question is, how does this present itself to everyday Syrian soldiers? Um, when you are in the Syrian military, you do not pray, you do not have tasbih, you do not go to the mosque. You do not use casual idioms that have religious connotations. Officers openly mock religion, uh, all of which is, is carefully constructed in order to create an environment where religious identity is excluded um, to almost Orwellian proportions. Um, the second is how he's broken up the ethnic homogeneity of certain regions of Syria to the advantage of the ruling regime, uh, particularly in the Kurdish region uh, throughout those homogenous Kurdish areas in the Jazeera area, he's moved uh, Arab communities in there in the 1970s, and the divisions that they created uh, continue to further the conflict as we see it today. Uh, so the question is, what is life in the Syrian military like, and how does sectarianism inform its structure? So placement within the Syrian military is defined, is, is based on ethnicity and sectarian lines, and uh, your hometown of origin, okay? So it's very careful placement. There's no hetero heterogeneous uh, groupings within the Syrian military. Um, and the officer corps in particular, as, uh, as was just discussed, is almost exclusively Alawite with the exception of those uh, Sunni officers from tribes which are particularly clients of the regime uh, for the most part. Kurds are excluded from the officer's college. Kurdish officers are almost unheard of. Um, so the majority of the rank and file soldiers in the, in the Syrian military are Sunni Arabs and Kurdish soldiers, um, particularly in sense of units are especially Alawite. One deserter explained to me that within armored units, every tank crew has three Alawites and one Sunni and Kurdish soldier, so that there's no risk of tanks being defected to the opposition. So. When you have the stark divide between the officers being predominantly Alawite and the junior enlisted men being Sunni and Kurdish, it exacerbates the ethnic tensions um, to an extreme amount. What it has allowed is there have not been major defections on the scale of major units because the officers are predominantly Alawite. However, it's created this deep divide between soldiers and their officers in the Syrian military. Uh, the incidence of soldiers killing their officers is very common uh, and even even if they do not take place, whenever officers are killed in combat, the rumor tends to spread within the Syrian ranks that it's possible that soldiers did it. Officers are known to carry large PSDs around with them because they're afraid of their soldiers. They keep soldiers loyal to them. 
uh, present at all times to prevent them from being attacked. Um, so we see at, at the very low level, there's this, this intense tension between the soldiers and their officers. Um, but the first point that I want to emphasize, so the question is why has the Syrian military not collapsed? Why have the desertions not reached a scale where they simply can't operate anymore? Uh, the first point I want to emphasize from talking with Syrian deserters is how intensely isolated Syrian soldiers are. In fact, quite often within Syria, there are few people who know as little about what is going on as Syrian frontline soldiers, uh, and that's by design. They are not allowed to have phones, although many acquire them, even though they're not supposed to. Uh, initially, they were able to talk to their families frequently, but sometimes not at all. And when they do speak with their families, they can assume that they're being monitored. Um, so there's this intense distrust of the regime, as well as their fellow soldiers. So if the morale is so low within the Syrian ranks, why are there not more desertions? Uh, and there are a number of major reasons, the first of which is the scale of summary executions. Uh, any Syrian deserter, any Syrian soldier who spent any length of time manning checkpoints can speak to the fact that large numbers of uh, young men who are either deserters or suspected of being deserters are summar summarily executed at checkpoints. So they are fully aware of what the consequences will be if they try to leave. Uh, as well as the dense network of checkpoints throughout Syria makes it extremely difficult for somebody without proper identification to try and leave Syria. So even if you deserted from your unit, your chances of trying to navigate all the checkpoints to a border crossing are very slim. Right, right, soldiers right. are aware of that and they're made aware of that by their officers. Um, Okay, okay. Let, let so, uh, and there's an intense amount of distrust. Even soldiers who express a desire to <clears throat> desert, they're aware that they can't trust their fellow soldiers in expressing this. One soldier related to me uh, a story of after a particularly terrible operation, 10 of his companions decided that they wanted to desert. Uh, but when they chose to desert, the 10 of them in the middle of the night, the other soldiers within the platoon. Uh, confronted them because they realized they would be arrested and blamed if they were allowed to, and this resulted in them actually getting into an engagement where most of the soldiers were killed and wounded in the process of deserting. Um, and this while the officer was sleeping, which shows that the distrust at the soldier level uh, that has been sown by the regime is very intense, and the isolation as well. Uh, another major deterrent is that deserters are very recognizable at checkpoints. Um, either their lack of identification or uh, uh, what they describe as being the depressed, haunted look that deserters have, even if this is all in their imagination, they feel they'll be easily recognizable if they try to leave. And lastly, and this seems like a minor detail, but they're very recognizable by their haircuts. So almost every deserter that spoke to me said that he had to spend a period of time growing out his hair before he would risk making it through checkpoints to try to leave Syria. So the second point I want to make about sectarianism in uh, as it affects the structure of the military is the deprofessionalization that has taken place across the ranks. Um, I spoke with deserters who belong to the Mukhabarat intelligence unit and special forces units and they are elites in name only. Uh, most of them training has been condensed from three to six months typically for specialization down to as little as two weeks. Soldiers are taught how to shoot and then they're sent to frontline units which makes the rank and file generally just uh, untrained soldiers which are being led by this Alawite Junior Officer Corps. Um, one deserter told me that during his basic training, uh, this is in 2012, a soldier attempted to escape and was shot and his body was held up in the yard to deter the other trainees from escaping. And that soldiers were frequently beaten to death during training because, not by design, but simply, uh, simply just to the nature of the discipline that they were receiving uh, during training. So on the battlefield, you have an Alawite officer corps managing uh, generally all the operations, and the only truly professional trained force on the battlefield on the regime side is those forces of Hezbollah and Iranians could force advisors. Um, another deep source of that deep professionalization is the rampant corruption on all levels. A uh, frequent statement of soldiers who've left uh, is that Everything's for sale in Syria. So there's basically two stories of desertion that I received from soldiers. One is where they took a very harrowing opportunity and they had a, a chance opportunity to escape and to uh, leave in the middle of the night, something very dangerous. And the other story I hear frequently is that they put a considerable sum of money together and they paid an officer to purchase pass papers, which they used to get to commissioning from there. They were managed to uh, 
escape across the border. Um, but all this is along sectarian lines between the division between the Alawi Officer Corps uh, and, the junior, and the junior enlisted men who actually do the actual fighting. Um, so even though mass desertions have taken place and the force is certainly depleted from what it was in 2011, the question is why is it still on the battlefield? And the story that keeps coming to me from these soldiers is that the organization of violence, uh, the fear and the structure, and their fear of not having any future life in Syria, or the fear of retribution to their families is a major reason which keeps them in the military. So any sense that the military is a non-sectarian actor uh, that is keeping the country together, uh, I think the evidence shows that the military itself, it embodies sectarianism and it perpetuates it. Um, and even though it has been, to the surprise of many, what has kept the Hafiz al-Assad, or the Bashar al-Assad regime uh, in power, it has done so uh, at terrible cost to Syria, as well as the, uh, the soldiers that have served within it. Thank you, Andrew. It seems that uh, sectarianism is a quite uh, structuring, dyna um, uh, structuring factor in the, in the way that you and uh, Fabrice uh, presented this conflict. I mean, I will be interested, actually, in understanding uh, if within the same sect, um, uh, for instance, from soldiers or people from Latakia, which is Alawite dominate, will be the same than uh, people from uh, Tartus, which is also Alawite dominate. I mean, is there any difference between the two? I mean, in Iraq, I can say that uh, Karbala is not like La Karbala is not like Najaf. Actually, they are both Shia-dominated city, but there is competition between the two. And uh, you know, Fallujah is not um, uh, Mosul. <laughs> they are Sunni, but uh, Sunni-dominated city, but they are not the same. So I think we can discuss further this. I will give the floor to Karen Abu Zaid, and then we have actually. Um, uh, uh, Bayan Jaber, who is also joining us uh, from uh, Baghdad, uh, who will give us later an insight from a uh, Baghdad perspective on the conflict. Please, Karen, is your, Thank you, your Marie. turn. I'm very happy to be here in a university that has vision, I think, something we've been talking about today and is much needed. Huh? But I'm here as a commissioner of the Independent uh, Impartial Commission of Inquiry on Syria Arab Republic. Uh, since the establishment of that commission, by the Human Rights Council in August of 2011. So I shall speak to you about the Syria of today that is in the thralls of a nearly three years of ever worsening conflict. The Commission's mandate is to investigate and document all <coughs> violations of international law committed in Syria since March 2011 and to promote accountability for these violations. The fact that the Syrian conflict has grown in intensity and scope is not a surprise to any of us. Over 200,000 Syrian refugees are registered here in the KRG. The war remains stalemated as the government relies on its superior firepower, including its control of the skies. Non-state armed groups, as we call them now, have increasingly resorted to suicide bombings and the use of Im improvised explosive devices. In El Raqqa government, more radical groups such as the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, ISIS, or Daesh, appear to be focused less on fighting the government than on establishing an Islamic State. Thousands of foreign fighters have joined the hostilities on all sides of the conflict, some openly in support of the government, others more clandestinely as individuals or armed groups for or against the opposition, fueling the sectarian dimensions of the conflict. Over the last six months, the landscape of the battle has become increasingly complex. Indeed, it's uh, perhaps a misnomer to call what is happening today in Syria a conflict, as it's apparent that there are multiple, sometimes overlapping, conflicts. Long brewing tensions between ISIS and other rebel groups have culminated in violent hostilities extending across north and northeastern governorates. Fighting between Kurdish forces and radical Islamic armed groups, also in Syria's northeast, have led to a distinct subconflict with its own front lines and internal military dynamics. For civilians living in Syria, the situation is bleak, as we've heard from several other speakers. Over 250,000 people are besieged inside their own towns and villages and subjected as well to relentless shelling and bombardment. The denial of humanitarian aid, including food, has been protracted in many areas, leading to malnutrition and starvation. Government forces have encircled parts of Damascus and Homs governorates with checkpoints, blocking access of food, medicine, fuel, and other necessities. 
The siege of old Holmes', Holmes old city was temporarily lifted to allow evacuation of civilians and a supply of food and other items to the area. At the same time, a recent photograph showing thousands of people queuing for food in Yarmouk camp, mainly Palestine refugees, in Damascus, underlines how desperate and how precarious the lives of the besieged have become. Non-state armed groups, including ISIS, <coughs> Jebel al-Nusra, and the Islamic Front have imposed sieges on northern Aleppo towns where thousands of civilians suffer. Many of the violations previously documented by the Commission in our six reports so far are committed with impunity. Government forces shell and airily bombard civilian inhabited areas across Syria. In some areas, aerial bombardment by helicopters and jet fighters is a daily occurrence. There's been a marked increase in the use of imprecise and lethal barrel bombs dropped into urban areas from helicopters at high altitudes. In Aleppo City, a sustained campaign of barrel bombing was observed from December 2013 through January 2014. Non-state armed groups also shell towns and villages and like the government, make no distinction between civilian and military targets. Torture is systematically employed at government detention facilities, by intelligence agencies, at checkpoints around besieged areas, and during house raids as a means to extract information and punish populations. Detainees are kept in inhuman, inhumane conditions, characterized by a lack of food, water, <coughs> food, hygiene, and medical care, leading to the death of many detainees. Non-state armed groups are increasingly using torture, usually in the form of severe beatings against groups perceived to be supporting the government. While civilians across Syria have been displaced largely by government shelling and aerial bombardments, we've documented two instances of non-state armed groups threatening violence unless civilians abandon their towns. In the Syrian Kurdish towns of Tel Abyad, Tel Aran, and Tel Hassel, in July last year, mosque loudspeakers were used to issue such orders. The threat of violence and subsequent related abductions raised the specter of deliberate displacement of a population on the basis of its ethnic identity. Women and children suffer particular vulnerabilities. The Commission has recorded instances of rape and other forms of sexual violence in government detention centers and at checkpoints. In al Raqqa, we receive reports of women being lashed by ISIS for failing to wear hijab. Children under age 18 have been recruited, recruited and used to participate actively in hostilities by pro-government militia, by armed groups, and by the YPG. Such practices are condemnable, and we are glad to note the YPG's statement in late 2013 that it would not use children under 18 in its forces. We were able to confirm their pledge yesterday in Ayrville. Much of what I've described is widely known. The violations are now woven into the fabric of the Syrian conflict. They found voice in newspapers, television, all over the internet. What the Commission offers is a methodology, a rigor, and significantly in the Syrian context, political impartiality. We talk about both sides. Besides the bleak picture I have painted, our <coughs> reports are not meant to serve as a litany of helplessness. Rather, they're meant to inform and to serve as a prompt for polit political and diplomatic action. What is occurring in Syria today, and undoubtedly will occur tomorrow, demands a claim on the world's attention. More than this, the violations of international law demand a response other than compassion and humanitarian aid from influential states, from the wider international community, and from the Security Council. In documenting killings, torture, and forced disappearances, and the bombardment of cities, among other violations, the Commission makes two commitments. The first is a pledge to the Syrian people that their suffering has been documented and will not be lost in the ether. Syrians insist they're not heard or they're not heeded. However, what they've told the Commission, we undertake to convey to those with the power to act now and in the years to come. There are no governments that can claim ignorance of the violations taking place daily, even hourly, in Syria. It's been the Commission's contention since our first report in December 2011 that the only uh, solution to this conflict is a political solution <coughs> achieved through inclusive negotiations led by the Syrians themselves, negotiations whose outcome must set out a pathway to accountability for those who bear responsibility for the crimes committed. This leads to the second commitment made by the Commission, 
namely to advocate for accountability, a key part of our mandate. Late October, last October, the Security Council issued a presidential statement which condemned the widespread violation of human rights and international humanitarian law by the Syrian authorities, as well as by any armed groups for their abuses and violations of international humanitarian law. Building on this acknowledgement by the Security Council, our commission maintains that the Security Council must seek a referral to justice to hold the perpetrators of these violations and abuses accountable. Continuing inaction on this front provides the space for the proliferation of actors inside Syria, each pursuing a separate agenda, contributing to the radicalization and an escalation of violence. Finally, a few words about Syria's future. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the depth and complexities of the Syria conflict, but that complexity often melts away when speaking to those affected. The day before yesterday, I visited the Koyergos camp outside Erbil. There I met with men, women, and children who had fled Syria to find safe haven in the KRG. One cannot walk through the refugee camps and speak to people living in quiet dignity in the tents without being reminded that the war in Syria is a tragedy for the country, its people, its society, its culture, and its history. Nearly nine million people, as we've heard before, close to a third of the population fled their homes since March of 2011. 2.5 million are refugees, as we've heard, registered in the neighboring countries, stretching host communities to their limits and provoking regional consequences. One fifth of Lebanon's population, as the Prime Minister reminded us this morning, are Syrian refugees. The Zatari camp has become one of Jordan's largest cities. At least six and a half million Syrians are internally displaced. Nine million Syrians in need of assistance and three million are described as hard to reach by the United Nations. Negotiations have accomplished little so far, but they've allowed the lifting of sieges in Homs and Damascus, and most hopeful of all, declarations of local Turkish around the country. The delivery of food and other necessity into these areas and the evacuation of civilians trapped inside their homes has been accomplished in large part because of human suffering in these areas areas in which people have been reduced to living on animal feed, grass, and cats, could and should no longer be countenanced. If we accept that the only solution is a political solution, then to reach that solution, influential governments and individuals must listen not only to voices in conference rooms in Geneva and New York and in Suleimania, but also to the stories of the Syrian people themselves. The conflict in Syria should be seen not only as a political problem, but more seriously as a human problem. As the Commission documents and publicizes the stories of Syrians whose lives have been shattered by the war, it's my hope that our work will contribute further to this understanding and help convince those who have power to effect change on the ground, to do so with the needs and the desires of Syrian people as their inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Karen. Indeed, uh, a sad account, uh, and um, I mean, I think in the question answer we can actually ask ourselves that beside uh, um, accounting, what the international community can actually do. Um, we'll probably discuss this later, and from the international community perspective, we jump back to the regional perspective on the Syrian conflict, and I would like to give the floor to. Mr. Bayan Jaber, who is a member of the uh, Iraqi parliament, who was before a member in the um, finance minister and uh, minister of the interior, who will give us uh, an insight on uh, uh, the pers perspective from Baghdad on, on the Syrian conflict. Please. <laughs> معارضا للنظام الدكتاتوري صدام حسين عشت في دمشق ممثلا للمجلس الأعلى للثورة الإسلامية في العراق ممثلا لشهيد المحراب آية الله السيد محمد باقر الحكيم وكذلك في بيروت ولذلك تركت 2003 وأنا أمتلك خلفية عن الوضع الاجتماعي والسياسي 
في سوريا الإخوان المسلمين منذ أواخر السبعينات بدأوا نشاطا بدأ من دمشق مرورا بحمص حتى حماه وكان لهم نشاط واسع وحركة عسكرية مدعومة من قبل النظام العراقي وكان خلاف بين البعث الصدامي والبعث الأسدي آخر معركة وصلت الضوء عليها حيث المدرسة الحربية في حلب دخلت مجاميع من الإخوان و دخلت إلى المدرسة وهي هذا مؤشر كبير وخطير أقف عنده أنا عندي كثير من الملاحظات باعتبار أن عندما دخلوا فرزوا الضباط في المدرسة الحربية إلى سماطين سماط كان العلويين إلى جنب والسماط الآخر هم بقية الطوائف السورية ونذكر كلنا حادثة قتل أكثر من 160 ضابط علوي فقط العلويين تم استهدافهم من قبل قيادة الإخوان وهذا ما أعطى مؤشر طائفي على حركة الإخوان في ذلك الوقت بعد ذلك نعرف قصة حماة وكيف قمعت هذه الحركة واستقر الوضع في البلد وأنا عشت هذه الحالات سيارات مفخخة جاءت من صدام حسين آخرها كان في الأزبكية راح ضحيتها العشرات من الأطفال والنساء دخلت دمشق 1982 أيلول أذكر ذهبت إلى هذه قصة مهمة جدا ذهبت إلى أحد المساجد مسجد أبي أيوب الأنصاري ولكي أصلي رغم أني شيعي المذهب لكن نحن نصلي في مساجد المسلمين أينما كانت فذهبت لصلاة الجمعة لم يكن هناك من المصلين في صلاة الجمعة يتجاوز العدد الخمسين وهو في حي الزاهرة بدمشق تركت سوريا 2003 عائدا كوزير للأعمار والإسكان في الحكومة الأولى 2003 ذهبت لأصلي الصلاة الأخيرة في هذا المسجد لم أستطع أن أصل إلى ذلك المسجد لكثرة المصلين امتلأت باعحة المسجد ومحيط المسجد حتى وصلت امتدت الصلاة إلى بيتي كيف ارتفع هذا العدد من أربعين إلى آلاف المصلين إن لم أقل كان أتجاوز يتجاوز ال 15000 ألف مصلي وهكذا في بقية المساجد الحركة الإسلامية ال التي بدأت في دمشق عسكريا في أواخر السبعينات وبدايات الثمانينات تحولت إلى أسلوب آخر من المواجهة مع النظام بالطريقة التبليغ والمحاضرات في البيوت وفي كل مكان وأنا كنت أراقبها يعني ولكنها كانت سلمية النظام ترك لها المجال حتى وصلت إلى هذا الحجم الكبير في أي مسجد تذهب من هذه المناطق التي أذكرها تجد أن المسجد قد امتلأ في حين أن سوريا بداياتها كنا نذهب إحنا كسياح كانت أغلبها علمانية يعني كان البعث مسيطر وطريقة عيشتهم كمجتمع لم تكن إسلامية لكنه أخذت هذا الطابع وهذا المؤشر ما حصل في الربيع العربي كلنا نعلم خريف العربي الشتاء العربي هي عملية تغيير سايس بيكو جديد للمنطقة منذ البداية كان عندي واضح أنها ستصدم, ستصدم هذه الحركة في سوريا واضح عندي كان وأنا قلت للكثير من الدبلوماسيين اللي اجتمعت وياهم في بغداد أن هذا الموضوع لن, لن يمر بسهولة بسوريا بمعرفتي بطبيعة الجيش السوري بمعرفتي بطبيعة المجتمع السوري حاولت هذه القوى وبعض القوى الإقليمية والدولية اللعب على الجيش أتحدث بدقة استطاعت أن أن تخرق ما يسمى بالجيش الحر ينفصل عن الجيش جسم الجيش لكن هذا لم يمتد كثيرا 
ولم يدخل حتى في عمق الجيش السوري بقي الجيش السوري يمتلك المبادرة وحافظ على وحدته الوطنية بكل قومياته لم يحصل انشقاق طائفي في داخل الجيش بدأت بعض المظاهرات ثم تحولت إلى عمل عسكري وكلنا نعرف هنا بدأت دول معينة في المنطقة تدعم ما يسمى تنظيم السلفيين إذا كان في البداية جبهة النصرة والداعش والكتائب المتعددة كتائب محمد رسول الله وكتائب الإسلامية وإلى آخره يمكن أكو عشر فصائل إسلامية كل منها يمتلك وجهة نظر تختلف عن الآخر عدا الجيش الحر الذي يمكن أقول أنه يمكن أن يكون هو الأفضل أداء بعيد عن الطائفية و البقيه انتهجوا طائفيه في هجوماتهم كل هجوماتهم انا مراقبها على اللاذقيه على طرطوس في حمص قرى معينه من طائفه معينه استهدفت لانها من طائفه معينه لكن بالمحصله لم تستطع القوام من ايجاد خرق في داخل الجيش السوري بل حتى في المجتمع السوري لايجاد خرق طائفي كما حصل في مناطق اخرى ومنها العراق المعركة الأخيرة أو قبل الأخيرة في القصير كانت معركة حاسمة لأن القصير كانت هي حلقة الوصل بينما يصل إلى سوريا من سلاح وعتاد ومال ورجال عبر طرابلس طرابلس لبنان وهذه معلومات طرابلس لبنان كانت تأتيها البواخر من ليبيا اللي هي مستقر الجماعات السلفيه ياتون من اغلب الدول العربيه يستقرون في طرابلس الغرب عفوا اول مره طرابلس الغرب اللي هي في ليبيا اضافه الى التدريب يتم في بنغازي ثم ينقلون مع العده والعدد الى طرابلس لبنان ومن لبنان يتم نقلهم عبر الجبال وانا اعرف هذه السلسله حتى يصلوا الى القصير ويدخلوا الى حمص باعتبار ان حمص تكون في قلب سوريا جنوبا تكون دمشق شمالا تكون حماة وحلب غربا تكون طرطوس بانياس اللاذقيه حتى كسب حتى الحدود التركيه نجاح السوريين بالتعاون مع الحركة الوطنية في لبنان يعني ليس فقط حزب الله كان له دور في دعم النظام السوري هذه لابد الإشارة إليها استطاعت سوريا أن تبني علاقات عميقة وعريقة مع حزب البعث اللبناني مع قوى وطنية لبنانية إضافة إلى إلى حزب الله اللي كان يتلقى الدعم المباشر وغير المباشر من 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 النظام السوري فكانت معركة القصير حاسمة قسم الظهر ما يسمى بالثوار او او المقاومين او محاوله الذين يحاولون الانقلاب على النظام لانها اوقفت الدعم اللوجستي الذي يصل الى هذه طبعا حاولوا الان المعارك التي تجري في يبرود وعرسال والى غير ذلك هذه منطقه اخرى مختلفه تماما عن القصير لكن كذلك الان هناك انحدارات لذا لاحظنا في الشهر الماضي هناك نف دفت النظام الجيش السوري والنظام السوري بدات تميل اقليميا بلا شك كان لايران دور كبير في دعم النظام السوري دوليا كان دعم كبير وكبير جدا من روسيا الى النظام السوري باعتبار ان هناك قاعده في طرطوس روسيه على البحر الابيض المتوسط وهي اخر قاعده يمكن لروسيا في المنطقه فروسيا دخلت بقوه دعما تسليحا الى اخره كما ايران. انا من الاشخاص كوزير ماليه سابق كنت اعتقد ان من سيكسر ظهر النظام وهذه نقطه هامه جدا هو العمله السوريه او الاقتصاد السوري. سوريا هي بلد الصناعة بلد الزراعة المصدر الأول تقريبا بالدول العربية في الزراعة والصناعة وأنا عايشها ومشتغل كرجل أعمال وكنا متوقعين كما حصل في العراق العراق شفنا أن الدينار العراقي 
كان يساوي 3.3 دولار بعدين صار الدولار يساوي 3000 دينار شوف ايش قد خسر الدينار العراقي من قيمته الاف المرات في حين ان الليره السوريه حافظت على قوتها من بدا الصراع كان الدولار يساوي 50 من الى الان وصل اقصى رقم يمكن بحدود 350 400 ليره للدولار والان رجع الى 100 ليره يعني فقط مرتين ضعف نسبه الانهيار بالاقتصاد السوري فحافظت الليره السوريه على قيمتها استطاعت سوريا ان 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 تستمر بالتصدير اللي حصل اعتقد ان الفتره الاخيره شهدت رجحان كفه الجيش السوري والنظام السوري في السيطره على الوضع وخصوصا في دمشق. نعم لا زالت حمص تعاني في بعض مناطقها لا زالت حلب وكذلك ادلب هذه المناطق والمناطق الشرقية من سوريا لا زالت تحت السيطرة تأثير على بغداد داعش التي هي الدولة الإسلامية في العراق والشام انفصلت عن القاعدة كما تعرفون انفصلت لأغراض يعني الخلاف اللي حصل بين الجولاني وبين البغدادي أبو بكر البغدادي وأبو محمد الجولاني القاعدة من من سمتها العامة وهي التنظيم العام للتنظيم القاعدة وهناك تنظيمات محلية مرتبطة بالقاعدة هذه تعطي فقهيا وسياسيا وعسكريا القيادة لابن البلد فالجولاني كان هو القائد وبالعراق كان أبو بكر ولا زال أبو بكر البغدادي هو القائد حصل خلاف ما بين الاثنين و شكلت وهو تنظيم محلي انا اعتقد ليس دولي داعش هو محلي فقط في العراق يعمل وفي سوريا هذا التنظيم استطاع ان يكتسح المكانين وبدا بحرب شرسه مع القاعده واعتقد عندنا قبل شهر حصلت معركه في دياله في السعديه ليس سعديه سعديه الشط انما السعديه الاخرى حصل قتال أكثر من 150 واحد من قيادات القاعدة من السعدية حتى سليمان بايك تم تصفيتهم من قبل داعش سيطرة والآن المسيطر في العراق هو داعش المسيطر في في سوريا أغلبه هو داعش وجبهة النصرة القاعدة لم يعد لها وجود حقيقي اللي هو تنظيم الدولي في سوريا والعراق إلا ما ندر يعني ليس ليس واسعا باعتبار ان الحدود سقطت اغلب مناطق الحدود بيد المنظمات السلفيه هي داعش وجبهه النصره استطاعت ان تدخل الى منطقه الصحراء الغربيه في العراق واسست قواعد لها منذ تقريبا سنتين هذه القواعد عباره عن بيوت عباره عن غرف وفيها قبو تخبئ الاسلحه هناك ثم تنقل الى بغداد او المحافظات الاخرى والى الان موجوده في هذه المناطق المعركه الاخيره التي كان الجيش مفروض يروح الى الصحراء حوران والابيض وعالي الفرات والثرثار كان مفروض يصفي هذه المناطق لكنه ما استطاع التوغل في الصحراء او ان هناك قرارا سياسيا اجله داعش هي الفاعل الذي الشر الذي جاءنا من من سوريا لذلك أنا أعتقد أن حتى لا أطيل أرجع أختصر الحل في سوريا سوف لن يكون عسكريا لا أستبعد أن هناك انشقاقات وانقساما سيحصل في جغرافيا أقصد في سوريا على المدى البعيد لكني لا أعتقد أن الحل هو حل عسكري الحل العسكري يعني مزيد من القتل مزيد من الدماء مزيد من تصدير الإرهابيين إلى المنطقة قد يعم الشر إلى الأردن وكذلك إلى لبنان والعراق وحتى تركيا سوف لن تكون بعيدة بمنأى عن عن التنظيمات السلفية لذلك أنا أعتقد حتى ننقذ الشعب السوري يجب أن نبحث عن حل حل تحت إشراف الأمم المتحدة حل الانتخابات الحقيقية الديمقراطية تحت إشراف الأمم المتحدة ولا بدون ذلك أعتقد سيبقى هذا السجال ستبقى هناك مناطق ساقطة بيد المعارضة
ومناطق مسيطر عليها من قبل النظام ويبقى هذا السجال السجال راح يصير لأكثر من ثلاث سنوات ودون نتيجة مزيد من الدماء إلا مزيد من الدماء والخسائر لهذا البلد وتدمير بناه التحتية جميعا هذا بشكل مختصر وتأثير على على العراق بلا شك أن إحنا هاي بوابة الشر حتى كانت عندما لم يكن هناك شيء في سوريا النظام كان مسيطر وسوريا كانت هي منبع الشر الذي يأتي إلى العراق من الغرب كل السيارات المفخخة والأسلحة التي كانت تأتينا وأذكر أنا كنت وزير داخلية هي كانت تأتينا عبر سوريا أغلبها يأتي عبر سوريا وكنا إحنا الضحايا لما قام به نظام الأسد في دعم هذه المجموعات الإرهابية فإحنا دفعنا الثمن سلفا ولا زلنا ندفع هذا الثمن علينا أن نساهم مع كل المجتمع الدولي أن نجد حلا سياسيا لكي نتخلص من هذه البؤرة الداعشية شكرا لحسن استماعكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا جزيلا I've lived many years in, in Syria and have many uh, friends on both sides of this conflict of all uh, walks of, of life some of which I dare not think uh, what they do on a day to day basis um, this has been an abomination of a conflict to cover over the past three years uh, from the outside and it's been worse still from the from the inside at the same time, this conflict is at a complete standstill. I think we coined at the International Crisis Group uh, two years ago the expression uh, evolving stalemate. Uh, very little is happening other than people dying like flies. Um, we could pay great attention to all the detail and continue an analyzing this conflict in the greatest, uh, uh, with the greatest minutia, I think, for, for years to come and still be sitting here uh, uh, engaging in what, what has become a very uh, academic conversation, a debate which, which is turning into a, an end in itself. The point I'd like to make, um, and first of all, I wanted to, uh, to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here in 15 years living in the region. It's the first time I come to, uh, to Erbil and, and Suleymaniyeh, which is uh, something I'm embarrassed to admit and at the same time proud to, to redress. So thanks for that. Um, what I want to speak to is really a, a conflict with Syria which amounts to a chaotic transition happening within a chaotic transition in the region at large, happening itself within a chaotic transition on an international level. On the national Syrian level, I think it boils down to a profound disconnect between the political system and how the society has evolved, and this is, I think, something that applies to many other countries uh, around the region. And this is a topic which virtually is not discussed. The conflict has become very personalized around the, uh, the issue of, uh, of the president. Of course, there's a lot of um, um, resentment due to the, the incredible levels and forms of violence this society ha has been put through, but I think it would be useful, and perhaps we can do so in the, in the, in the questions and answers, uh, to steer the conversation back towards what's, what's playing out within this country in terms of the need to correct this uh, this profound disconnect between the nature of the political system, how it evolved over time, and uh, uh, how society itself evolved over, over time. Now this chaotic transition is happening in a region which is in profound disarray for reasons I'd like to, uh, to lay out. One is that the region, in my view, is undergoing the deepest crisis it's been through uh, in, a, in a century or more. Um, everything is at play. There's a failure to conceptualize, I think, among the elites what is uh, playing out in Syria uh, and, and, and beyond. And meanwhile, as these conflicts continue to unfold, I think all the dynamics that actually led into them, that, that prompted the uprisings in, in 2011, are being reinforced by these conflicts or by the courses of actions uh, taken by, by the various uh, players in them. The economies are going down the, the drain, Infrastructures are further uh, eroding. The rural exodus into informal neighborhoods is picking up. The brain drain too, uh, and so on and so forth. I think there's a kind of uh, attempt to go back to forms of, of, of power and leadership which predominant, predominated prior to 2011, although we all know very well that they're very much part of the problem. And the, the political culture also, which I think the, the region is stuck in and which is a product of of several uh, decades of, of political practice, 
is underpinning a lot of these courses of action and in ways that only reinforce, I think, uh, the, uh, the original uh, causes of, of these crises. I wanted to touch upon the sectarian dimension, which is very much uh, a taboo, uh, and very present on our minds, something that should not be blown out of proportion, of course, but cannot be ignored either. In my, in my perception, and there again speaking uh, on the basis of, of many years in the region, in, living in Iraq, living in Lebanon, in Syria, and, and, and elsewhere, I have a feeling, and this is you know, a tentative idea I want to put to you, that part of the problem is really the modus vivendi that needs to be found between the sense of empowerment, of vindication um, in, in the Shiite world as a result of decades of socioeconomic empowerment, very true in Lebanon, in Iraq, uh, but also a number of extremely powerful symbolic victories over the past decades, uh, leading into this, uh, <coughs> this sense that the moment ought to be seized, uh, the sense of, of, of ownership. Uh, over uh, the dynamics at play in, in, in these conflicts. On, on the other side, there again in my experience, a very, very profound crisis uh, in the Sunni world. Well, Sunni worlds, increasingly fragmented, uh, bereft of, of any clear direction, um, confronted with a series of failures, and maybe they go back all the way to the Nahba in the, in the late uh, uh, 19th century. The republics that promised an emancipation from uh, the colonial era uh, devolved into authoritarian rule. The Islam, various tr strands of Islamism that developed in the 80s and 90s uh, have not offered any clear alternative. Al-Qaeda itself, and up to the uprisings uh, today, which promised the moment of revival, of renewal, and are turning into, uh, into disaster. So I feel that the sense of injustice, disenfranchisement, disarray, um, powerlessness, the Maslumiya, some would say, in Lebanon, has changed hands uh, and, uh, and generating a lot of the kind of violence that we're seeing uh, on the part uh, of, uh, of elements of the Syrian opposition, but fueling also violence in, in Iraq and, and in Lebanon in what is becoming increasingly a, a, an integrated arc of, of, of conflict, of crisis. And finally, I mean, the fourth and last point I wanted to make on this region in disarray, and this affects Syria, among other things, is, is a downsizing of what has been a very structuring U.S. role in the region for, uh, for decades, for better or worse, and I think for worse in the recent period. Now, the U.S. is not leaving. It's still committed to some of its longstanding, and I would say overdue uh, commitments in the region. Um, certainly, it wants to continue to retain a presence uh, in the Gulf, but beyond that, I think, its residual um, interests or uh, commitments um, boil down to a moral responsibility over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and that's coming to an end, I think, with the, with the push we're seeing on the part of, of Kerry, and also the issue, the nuclear issue uh, in Iran. There's no, as you know, no interest for the Syrian conflict in itself. I think it's the, the gravest uh, conflict the region is, is going through, and in three years we see the U.S. incapable of defining even a policy, uh, an intelligible policy, uh, however ambitious or modest on the contrary, uh, in, in that context. And that adds to the disarray in the sense that the U.S.'s traditional um, adversaries, they again feel empowered, perhaps overreach, uh, and on the contrary, their traditional allies, um, projecting themselves into the Syrian arena, do so uh, through day-to-day -day improvisation in a very, uh, I think, unhelpful way at times. And finally, I wanted to, to, to discuss this idea of a, of a chaotic transition happening also at the international scale. I mean, I sense that what Syria suggests, points to, is, is a collapse of the international system of, of governance, or at least a suspension of the international system of governance as it developed uh, in the aftermath of the, the Second World War and gelled around U.S. Uh, hegemony in the, in the aftermath of the, uh, the Cold War. Uh, all the institutions that were established appear stalemated today. The norms that were there again painstakingly established over decades are uh, eroding. Uh, and we really, 
that an organization like the International Crisis Group, we have nothing to work with or we have no one to make recommendations to uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the gravity of this conflict because we are ourselves a product of this uh, international system of governance uh, that today seems to be challenged in so many different ways from the outside and also from, um, from within. Um, this ties into, I think, a moment of confusion and indetermination in the way we, uh, we deal with or we relate to conflict. Um, in the Syrian context, none of the courses of action uh, taken by players involved directly in the conflict, in my view, can be understood through ideology or values or strategy and interest. I mean, this relates or is grounded in, in fears, in instincts, identity politics, uh, cynicism, or on the contrary, indecisiveness when it comes to, uh, to the US. And at the back, backdrop of all this, I find they're again trying to step back from the conflict after a number of presentations delving deeper into the detail, I think is another moment of confusion in the way we, we deal with information. I mean, the Syrian conflict is perhaps the best documented conflict ever. We know everything about this. Every, I mean, the smallest incident uh, has been uh, recorded uh, in ways that can be seen as credible or not, but basically what's striking in this conflict is how much opportunistic cherry-picking uh, of information uh, everyone seems to be willing to, uh, to engage in and base their courses of action on almost entirely uh, at the expense of, of factual analysis. And meanwhile, the costs of this conflict are constantly rising not just for Syrians, which was the case originally, but more and more so for Syria's environment and the international community at large, turning the whole conflict in what I would describe as a strategic absurdity. So my bottom line, and to finish us on that, is that Syria is not some ugly conflict between sects and tribes in a forsaken part of the world. It really is a mirror in which one could claim an ugly world uh, reflects itself in, and that's, that's an image that we should we should ponder. Syria is not uh, simply a, a victim or a symptom of the situation I tried to, to describe, but very much a catalyst of it, accelerating, I think, this moment of, of transformation, uh, for better or worse, uh, within the international system, but one which beckons reinvention, I think, in terms of how we relate to the conflict rather than falling back on uh, well-known uh, and tired narratives. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for um, so for um, giving us uh, really a sense of uh, where the Syrian conflict stands, also in terms of history. I mean, what kind of role it has in the transformation of the international community. I I have a lot of uh, social media questions coming from Twitter, but uh, I will prioritize human beings in front of me and pick one question and then shift on a Twitter one. So, um, uh, yes, please. <coughs> Mr. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. My name is uh, Mohammed Jaber, academician, ex-president of Al Nahrain University. Since the morning, you guys scare me so much. I'm very scared. Because it sounds like you have already put us into <coughs> compartments, comp compartments which you know how to distinguish, and you have divided the people into categories. Before, when we move around in countries, we go to cities. We don't go to compounds. We go to cities. We go to this and that. Now, there is a, a question I'd like to address particularly to uh, Mr. Fabrice Blanche. Now, you can redirect it to anywhere else later on. The question is, are you guys, when I say you, as intellectual who are affecting the political opinion? So we don't ignore that you are affecting political opinions in Iraq or wherever it is. Now, are you studying a phenomenon, a phenomenon called regionalism just for scientific purposes and for academic purposes? 
the delicate part of it. If yes, you are studying it, it exists, and you are studying for particular purposes, the delicate part is, aren't you, by doing so, you are enhancing it, since you affect the mentality of the <coughs> politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Fabrice, you want to answer directly? Um, Should keep this Yes. Sure. Um, well, I'm not a spy. Huh? I'm not working for the, the defense uh, minister. I'm scientific. When I started my study in Syria 20 years ago, I was trying to understand the regional planning of Syria. And after a few months, I understand that it was impossible to understand Syria without sectarianism. It was at the beginning of the 90s, 20 years before this crisis. And um, I tried to understand the, the process of construction of the, the territories. And um, I have seen that uh, we are we, the, the Syrian government say, I am secular, secular uh, government. Um, there is no differences in Syria between Christian, Muslim, and uh, other people. But in fact, when I was studying on the field, on the ground, every, every construction, every administrative division, I have seen that everything was building related to sectarianism. Because this is uh, the, 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 the body of the Syrian government. And after, uh, Syria is not different from Lebanon. In Lebanon, the sectarianism, it's institutional. It's, uh, it's open. In Syria, it was closed, <coughs> but it's the same function. Iraq, I don't know too much the situation, but I think that we have the same trend in, uh, in, the, in all the Middle East. Thank you, Fabrice. So we shift to the second question, the first row. Please, microphone here. Well, I'm sorry to... I understand your question. <laughs> I was myself completely heartbreaking. But this is not your role. You are experts. And there is a huge difference in between experts and people in charge of something, like the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So, just a question. This is not to blame you or to criticize you. You are expert. So, the question is, what were we supposed to do? Was it possible to do something? Is it only to listen to the crimes, to the difficulties, to the suffering, to the refugees, to the camps, to the UN, etc.? Were we, we, the human be people, <coughs> human being, international community, as we used to say. Were we supposed to do something or not? Were we able to do something or not? Because it has been, let's say, roughly, we tried. And we were not supported. And I remember myself, you rumble servant. In my country, we used to demonstrate in the streets, French street. For Syria, nobody. I participated in, on three demonstrations. We were 150 or 200. We were not interested. There is, like the expert called that, a compassion fatigue. But it was not only that. We were not interested because the way this maelstrom, very mixed uh, people, different people, were involved, was very difficult to understand. And so in my country, we passed from the invitation to Bashar el-Assad at the 14th of July, big demonstration of friendship. Then we wanted to bomb him, but we did not. Because, uh, as you know, the American at the last moment, not because of the war, but because of the use of chemical weapons, we decided to respond, but we did not. So where, wh what we were able to do? Was it possible to intervene? Was it possible to participate, to make a little pressure on this big massacre? I have an answer, but <laughs> I want to... I have an answer because at the beginning, at the beginning, when, as you said, the people, the first fighters against the regime, 
were more or less democrats. We call them democrats. It was possible to intervene in that time in order to, to make a real pressure on the military people in Syria in order to stop the bombing of the civilian. Because the worst of that is that 95% of the dead person are civilian. And as you know, according to the Geneva Convention, it is not completely allowed. So where are we able to do so? Thank you. We, um, I mean, it was very clear, and I think this raises really a point that is under discussion with my colleagues since long time. What is the role of the experts? What is the role of the international community? I think that uh, we should actually evolve into this in sense of um, probably not thinking that the international community should always <coughs> give answers, but uh, actually probably more work together with the regional leaders from the region and find solution together. But uh, I mean, we can extend this probably if anyone wants to intervene. Um, I mean, I, 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 you know, indeed, we've, we've been having this ongoing debate in terms of taking positions ourselves and um, trying to make recommendations to various uh, governments. You know, many things could have been done differently. And I think, you know, what I would say still applies today. So that, that what, that's what makes it relevant rather than just spending time looking back. On a diplomatic level, I think a lot of what we did in the West uh, amounted to public relations more than foreign policy. We could have been far more, I think, uh, consistent and cautious uh, than we were on such a you know, sensitive uh, conflict. We always knew it would be highly sensitive, um, risky, and costly. I think that's, that's a conclusion we could draw from day one. I think on the humanitarian front, we could be infinitely more creative in terms of finding ways uh, for uh, aid to actually reach people on the ground. I see a lot of money being spent in ways that don't reach Syrians, and given the scale of this uh, disaster described by Karen, uh, uh, I think we need to overcome all the hurdles posed by one of the most, if not the most complex uh, humanitarian challenge uh, we've faced so far. Militarily, we've never been proponents of military intervention or arming the opposition and so on, but at least I think the notion of doing no harm should apply, and uh, if arming the opposition is an option for some of its sponsors, it should be done there again, you know, with, a, with more of a policy than just throwing money and weapons at the problem, more coordination and, you know, a clear definition of what the objectives are. Finally, on the economic front, I mean, having spent seven years in Iraq, mostly under uh, the former uh, regime and during the embargo, I saw many of the mistakes uh, made uh, in that context um, uh, occur again uh, within the same decade uh, and on the part of governments who didn't seem to learn a lesson uh, from, uh, from something so, so, um, uh, so fresh in their minds.